Welcome to the Altus Insights podcast series with Ray and Marlin, hosted by me, Avi. This podcast will cover monthly market updates and construction cost impacts across major markets in Canada. In part two of our first episode, we'll be discussing cap rates, construction cost impacts on all assets, the accelerated evolution of retail, and a deeper dive on office market values. Let's rejoin the conversation. Uh, so we spoke a bit about res, residential, sorry. I'm going to switch it over to commercial a, l- a little bit. So Ray, I know, you know, a few years back, cap rates were sitting at around 5 to 8%. And then we saw them kind of drop to that 2 to 3% range. Are they expected to stay in that range? Are there certain assets that, you know, we're going to see stronger cap rates or is it going to continue trending down? What are, what's your perspective on uh, the asset types and the cap rates? If you could kind of break it down by asset. Well, well, the easy one is uh, <clears throat> apartments or multifamily that we've always seen very low cap rates in that in that area in Vancouver. We've seen them close to about um, less than than two percent, but now we're starting to see sort of a similar phenomenon in, um, in industrial. So for certain tenants, um, um, you're seeing some ca- cap rate transaction, and again, this was unheard of you know, five years ago, of less than. Uh, Three percent, and a lot of the changes that we've seen on the retail side and uh, the office side for for cap rates, so, sort of the big chunks happened in the last eighteen months, especially on the on uh, on the retail side. So now we're seeing more of a of a flattening, but it, it's it, it's interesting now with some of the transactions. It's not what it appears. Uh, we've seen a couple of um, downtown office um, sales that sold at a very low cap rate, but it wasn't really indicative of the current office use. It was more indicative of the new use or the proposed use three to five years down the road on either a condo or, or, or a multifamily. So anything we find with a little bit of, of hair on it with increased developable land or increased upside in rental based on a renovation or um, increased sort of mixed use, adding a residential or commercial use to it, that those potential opportunities will fetch sort of a, a premium, knowing that um, the, the, the property will be re- repositioned for higher returns down the road. So definitely, you know, it, for multifamily and industrial, we still will see continued low cap rates. It'll be interesting to see some of the transactions on on the other type going forward. And not to mention sort of your specialty sort of investment. You know, a lot of discussions right now about life sciences and, and data centers. You know, the, the challenge with them is that they have slightly higher operating costs and the cap rates a little bit higher. But again, it represents increased um, yields for for investors. So there's a lot more interest in those other sort of niche um, property sectors. And it'd be interesting to watch and see how their values perform because definitely there's there's um, there's a higher yield as reflective of the risk for some of those the niche players, even the the, the public storage area. And we we saw a lot more sort of activity in that area especially with um, the, the growth in uh, condominium sales and and uh, the need for storage in, in the not just in the suburban area, but in urban areas. Mm-hmm. And staying on the topic of industrial, Marlon, do you feel like industrial was impacted more than the other asset classes? Were they impacted equally on the construction cost side? What kind of trends are you seeing across the different asset types? Well, I think industrial traditionally would be the the lowest cost asset to build on a square foot. If you looked in terms of how much it cost, uh, the industrial would be the lowest. And then we'd start moving into stuff like storage, specialist use, then sort of office, residential. And obviously the government goes at the far end because when you print money and you're not driven by a profit and loss, it's different economics. Um, industrial was hit particularly with certain trades, mainly around steel. It's highly sensitive to steel. Obviously, in essence, I mean, the Aussies call them a shed. So in essence, it's the steel shed. Um, so it was hit significantly, um, but it was hit significantly relative to what people were used to playing for industrial versus their escalation being more or less than the other asset types. It would still be at the lower range. And it, like I say, it's more material specific on industrial. 
Um, and the other thing with industrial is you can you can no longer look at industrial all as one market. As Ray touched on, there's some unique aspects in the industrial market. Um, a 40 foot clear, which is a typical industrial building, would be influenced by a certain degree of escalation. Once we we look at a two story, or we start looking at 70 foot clear automated ones and specialist stuff that some of the larger uh, retailers are looking at, that stuff would have been hit much harder than a more basic warehouse, just because of the level of complexity, the level of steel required, and sort of the the the, the processes around it, cold storage, etc. That is high volume of um, equipment. But generally, residential was hit probably the highest with the exception, again, of the, the government renovation projects in terms of escalation. And I would say that is similar across all of the, the geographical locations in terms of who was hit the most and who will probably bear the brunt going forward as well, just because of the sheer volumes on the high rise and the low rise again until, low, until we sort of catch up to the market. Mm -hmm. And just to add Barla's comments on the industrials, I will... <coughs> We're sort of struggling there with um, some of the, the reposition of, of some of those assets. And we're already seeing two-story industrial in Vancouver. And you would think that based on um, some of the, 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 the rents that is, is justifiable in the GTA as well, but we just haven't seen it. I think partly is due to sort of municipalities and governments sort of keeping up with that sort of different type of use or different type of industrial. Um, so I, I think that's going to delay some of that, that process, that some of those things that can address the, the shortage, because similar to the residential, there's not enough supply to keep in uh, demand for industrial. And the GTA typically builds between 10 and 12 million square feet a, a year, and 90, 95% of that is is leased up before for completion, right? So it'd be uh, it, going forward, it'd be interesting to see that the pivot with industrial developers, how to accommodate some of those costs and increase densities for some of those projects that we've already seen in the rest of the world, such as Asia with multi-story industrial. We just don't have that here. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. And, you know, even before the pandemic, we spoke about how industrial was becoming the hottest asset type and, you know, retail was kind of transitioning from boring retail to experiential retail. I'm wondering during the pandemic, did we see an acceleration of that? Is that trend still happening? Is it stronger than ever? Or are tenants able to still maintain their regular retail uses even during the pandemic? Well, um, you saw that pivot, right? With the pandemic, the, the big concern was safety um, with, with with consumers and, and people just going into um, real estate period. So there's a lot of investment by owners with uh, HVAC system improvement and and, and, and and filters to provide that assurances and, and, and sort of social distancing within the malls and you know, one way traffic, one, one side of the, the mall compared to the others. So uh, there's an evolution on the safety in dealing with the pandemic. And the stores have uh, continued that evolution before the, the, the pandemic um, increase in more experienced retail. And yeah, unfortunately, in the last couple of years, especially with uh, some of the, the uh, less old national brands that we've seen sort of um, sh transition out or have gone bankrupt. But we're finding new retailers come into the marketplace, especially a few on the on, on the foreign side. So we're, we're seeing sort of a continued evolution and as well as upgrade of, um, of um, malls and, and regional centers. And as well as the increase, especially uh, a mall like Yorkdale, increase in luxury brands. But again, it's not all the malls that are going to survive this. Some of the the the, the malls and some of the or the retail in the tertiary markets were not um, positioned, or in the the tenants weren't um, well positioned to be able to cover some of the, that that drop in business. So some there will be some demolition and as well as the change in uses, perhaps more mixed uses, which we saw before the pandemic with some of the regional malls adding the residential component of it and maximizing the, 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 the return on those properties. So I think retail is here to stay just because people need to 
is that social interaction with restaurants and being out and asking questions that you can't do online. And for retailers, they really need the brick and mortar because the percentage, if, if you're shopping online, and I, I think we all experience this, you're looking for one or two items. But you know, this classic example with Costco, we go in there for a bag of milk and we end up spending $300 on things that we never planned for. So those are the things that retailers are betting on, that when you're in the store, you're picking up more than that one item. And it's, it's very strategic in how they position where the, where the products are. So I think we're still going to see a continued evolution and change, and, and um, you know, especially on the service aspect for, from, from retailers. Maybe we need a survey. Has anyone ever actually left Costco spending less than $300? No matter what you go in for, it always is $300, no matter what you go in for. <laughs> <laughs> We've tried, and the thing is, I think um, this one time we got it down to about $25, but that's even picking up three items. So even just trying to go in for a bag of milk doesn't work. And, and Costco, it's they've, they've gone into those express um, checkouts as well for the smaller items. So I think some people are doing that, and, and it moves a lot quicker. But even Costco is starting to pivot their motto based on, what their needs are, but it's uh, you're right. It's, it's a big challenge for, for us with Costco. Yeah, and I think to Ray's point um, around intensification of malls, I think that's going to be the, it had already started pre-pandemic. I think that's going to be the story of the next 10 years. You're going to see that real evolution of the secondary malls in particular for intensification. And then the primary malls have spent a lot of money renovate and improve the experience and we'll start to see intensification at them as well. It's very logical mixed use development. If you you think about, I wanna build, I've got 300,000 square foot of retail and I add 3000 departments, all of a sudden I've got built in customers. So there's a definite logic to it. And I think that transit orientated um, uh, projects and developments um, I know that's the buzzword of this year, but I mean, that's been going on for a long time. I mean, building by, lo building by transit it's logical, but I think we're going to see those get bigger, larger scale, and that's where you're going to see stuff like office, stuff like retail do very well, because they're, they're going to be the anchor point of the project, and the residential is going to be there, but the anchor will be something different that really brings in people to the site, connects them to transit. Um, the challenge with those is they tend to be a bit more expensive, but we've seen some fun stuff now. It used to be mixed use was all horizontal mixed use, so the uses changed as you moved horizontally. Now you've seen a mix of vertical and horizontal, and you've seen some extremely large projects by a number of clients uh, across Canada, really. And I think you're going to see that trend just carry on, and some of these projects are going to get huge. Um, but they're the ones where you can make office, retail, it all kind of makes sense when you can put it together with, in a mixed-use bag in a fantastic location. Absolutely. And you know what? We've seen a lot of development applications like Promenade Mall, Scarborough Town Center, Golden Mile, Center Point. now. We're seeing a lot of those development applications come in to, you know, add retail, but also intensify and add a lot of that residential space and kind of create these master plan communities. So uh, there's definitely evidence of that. And, and I agree. So going back to office a bit, I know we touched upon it a little bit, but I know everyone always asks about the office market and, you know, how things are going to be impacted from COVID. So now that workers are slowly going back and uh, we're expecting things to open up a little bit more over time, how is this going to affect the office values in terms of costs? Are we, are we gonna see them go up? Are they gonna stay consistent? What are we expecting to see on the office side once workers start really going back to the office? You know, let me, let me start from an investment standpoint, especially the last um, few months. And we've seen quite a bit of Downtown, you know, double A uh, office building in Transaca, um, and in Montreal and Toronto, and and as well as um, uh, Calgary, and the most recent being uh, the Royal Bank Plaza. So, one from an investment standpoint, there is still demand for those type of assets at um, at you know, <laughs> record um, prices, and I, I I'm a big believer of um, of of going back to your office for, from that social interaction, the way to brainstorm, to have those accidental meetings, and as well as for people to sort of be seen by, by senior management and having that level of interaction as well as the coaching and mentoring. So I think that's been missed, especially the last couple of years. Saying that, I also think that this hybrid model of 
a balancing of three to five days between three and five days in the office um, and then working from home and having that flexibility. I think that's still needed. And plus that's not going away. And the realization for co- some companies that the actual, some departments actually, is, it, they actually work better and more productive, not being in the office, especially with that um, commute. Um, and there's still that, 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 that concern for the, pa- with the pandemic with getting on public transit. So I think eventually that, um, we're, we're going to see a, a, a return to the office, maybe not in the, in the same way. And definitely what owners and companies have done to reposition their, their office use is it's, it's different, more of collaboration, more of, 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 um, interaction and to, to come in for a reason and not just not just to work at your desk nine to five. So I think we're still going to see a continuation of that. And we definitely saw the the increase in lease activity um, last year um, and, and that's continuing this year. So we know that people are still leasing spaces and it's different c- configuration. They're being a lot more smart with their space and outlining what, what the real needs are. But I think eventually that office demand will will um, come back to, to not you know, almost to the same level of occupancy. But from a, a price standpoint, we haven't really seen that sort of decrease. If anything, what we saw in the suburbs, um, um, some of the office campuses are being um, sort of reconverted or converted to to industrial type uses. And again, that's just because it's a higher um, value or um, highest and best use for that for that site. So I think we're going to see some of that demolition and Calgary as well. We see we're seeing some um, conversions there to to sort of um, affordable housing or apartments. So I think we're going to see continue evolution of how we use and interact office. But again, from a social standpoint, I think it's still very much needed to have that interaction as well as to be able to retain and attract top talent. Yeah, and people are still looking at new construction office and people are still, there's still a lot under construction. I mean, Vancouver um, and Toronto still have significant amounts of office under construction and you don't have to go back too far till there was a, there's a fairly significant period where nothing was built. And I think also the newer products being built at a very, very high standard. It's a, it's a different type of product. Um, a lot of it has a lot more amenity in it and whatnot. And again, it's that different way of working where there's more common space, there's more amenity space, and those changes are going to carry on. Um, but I think part of the challenge on the office is going to be that, that it's like all the other assets. The rates have to stay up there because the cost of construction is so high, the cost of land is so high, you, you still have to make money. So it, it's going to be the same challenge. And I think office, give it a couple of years, see how it plays out. And I think to raise point, we're, we're, we're going to see a lot of the panic vanish and a return to some form of normality, even if that looks very slightly different to where it is now. Yeah, it's it's not that long ago, pre-pandemic, that there's a that need for to be in the the urban areas. And in Vancouver and Toronto, you had less than four uh, percent vacancy rates on, on these buildings. And there's a pent up demand for people wanting to come downtown, but not enough space. So the, 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 and when when you saw that you know ten to twenty million square feet of buildings announced under construction, there was a bit of a concern that we knew that the the vacancy rate was going to go up when these buildings were going to be complete. But there was also that that pent up demand. There was just not enough space. And now what we're seeing is to Marlon your point that that pre-lease activity has not dropped off with um, the, the, the buildings under construction. But the challenge now is that backfill space that they're leaving and it could be slightly or, you know, older B or C building and how they're going to pivot and um, you know, reposition themselves to, to address some of those concerns with, with better HVAC systems and others that the newer buildings are are offering, especially with space layout and how they're going to compete in the space and whether or not they're going to be um, converted into or into a mixed use or, or or something else. But there's definitely a demand for that new space, allowing for um, better social distancing as well as to deal with some of the the um, you know the air filter or the the, the concerns with um, with how um, the, the the space is, is ventilated. 
Yeah, and I think going back to, if you go back three or four years ago, even way before the pandemic, a lot of people were talking about potential conversion of these Class C, marginal Class B offices into alternate uses. I think for that to work, there's there'd have to be some sort of agreement with the municipalities where this traditional, you have to replace the office in the new development in some of these areas where that doesn't really make sense, having that flexibility where that work use can be changed just to pure residential or, uh, again, industrial, but with a lower density of workers. And that we, we can sort of, again, be a bit more flexible in the approvals, recognizing realistically the Class A office needs to be on transit, it needs to be in the right location. And some of these secondary office areas where we do have these old Class see buildings that need a lot of work, just tear them down, replace them with higher density, but an alternate use. The continual need to then shove 100,000 square foot of office back into the building for no apparent need whatsoever. I mean, if you couldn't lease the building up before and it was a questionable office area, it's probably still a questionable office area. So why force someone to do it just for the sake of it? So again, it's that a little bit out of the box imagination you've seen in Calgary of affordable housing going into some office space, um, getting away from rigid rules. And I think, you know, like I say, more flexibility, more nimble, a little bit more entrepreneurial, again, my, the favorite word of the podcast, but trying to change things a little bit. There's, uh, we have to do everything the same way we've always been doing it. Mentality has really got to change at some point or we're going to be in a whole world of trouble, I think. Yeah. Altus Group released its Canadian Construction Cost Guide, which is free to the public and has some really wonderful information. Marlon will spend a couple minutes just explaining some of the insights that are available in the cost guide. Yeah, so I think that with the cost guide, as soon as we issue each year, it's extremely popular, both in the volume of downloads and the number of questions I get. So what I'd like to do is just talk about a little bit about some of the questions we've been discussing in our, with clients that are in the cost guide. And there's a couple of key things from it. One, um, there's no two projects the same. That's why you're starting to see the, the large range between uh, certain asset types. Um, and especially now the, the way the ge Geographical starting to change in terms of like development. We spoke about earlier in the podcast about stuff moving out. Um, so the GTA now is much broader than it was, say, 10 years ago. Um, the same would apply if you were in Vancouver now, where Fraser Valley, Valley Burnaby, and whatnot. So there's different, there's different project types within that. The other thing is it's a guide. There's going to be lows, there's going to be highs, it's an average. Um, well, Needs to get less obsessed with the number. It's based on thousands of thousands of projects. So there's going to be some aggregation in there. And then the other thing that's really interesting from this year's cost guide is you start to see the GTA costs separate a little bit at the low end from the other um, locations. And that's partly due to the extreme levels of escalation in the GTA. So some of those, some of those have increased by 20, 14% on the low side. The top side hasn't gone up quite as much. And again, that's part of that discussion we kind of had earlier where the lower end of the market's evolving a little bit. If you're charging $1,100 a square foot, there's a certain quality expectation that may have differed from the good old plastic laminate countertops, you know, 10 years ago. Um, and then the other thing from the cost guide is when you read the parking section, parking is horrific. Try to build as little as humanly possible and only what you need. Thank you, Marlon. And we'll, we'll post a link for how to download and how to get access to that construction cost guide. Just to close it off, though, I know both of you don't sleep much at night. So maybe share with us what keeps you up at night or any final thoughts or points or anything that you think is worth mentioning. We'll start with you, Marlon. Oh, okay. So uh, obviously pre-Christmas, there was the big warning at the LCBO there was going to be shortages of wine and scotch. So that kept me up for a while until I filled my wine fridge up with Australian wine and I have way too many bottles of scotch, which might be a, another indicator that the pandemic's still going on as well. And um, there seems to be a direct link between number of bottles of scotch and lockdowns. Um, but aside from the humor side of things, I think there's a couple of things that... Um, I worry about a little bit. One of the, the biggest ones we've touched on today is affordability. And where is that top point for affordability? Um, and again, I, I mentioned it earlier. Say it was in Midtown and it's six, $660 a square foot in 2016. Just in the middle of the pandemic, you were probably starting to get to 1150 a square foot. Now it's $1,400 a square foot. Where does that top end go? Recognizing, as I mentioned earlier, the developer's not really making any more money either. So it's not that this is funding profit. This is just keeping up. So that that affordability and where do we end up with the top end? And that would be the same as if you move across to Montreal, you move across to Vancouver. They, they all have their challenges in terms of how high can revenue go at the top end. I think the bottom's always going to carry on creeping up. And the same would apply to, to the rents, which I think Ray touched on earlier on the industrial. It would apply to the purpose-built rental as well. It's not just uniquely a residential challenge. I think just Residential is a little more in the news because people can't buy hounds. So it's more newsworthy and it's easy to put as a, as a headline as well. 
Um, the other sort of challenge we're starting to see now is stuff like interest rates is a little bit of a nervousness. How far are they going to go up? That impacts the person buying, impacts the person developing, impacts the person acquiring sites, impacts the entire development industry across the board. So how long can we print money before interest rates have to go up? Then how high do those interest rates need to go up? Recognizing that the economy is in a little bit of a unique situation. And then the final thing that tends to keep me up, uh, we won't jump on inclusionary zoning again, because I think we did that one to death, but is, is this volume of work in the Canadian market. Um, and although there's been some peaks and troughs in some other areas, Vancouver in particular has had a spike up and down. Um, Montreal and Toronto in particular have been extremely hot since 2016, 2017. So, and I, I usually make the joke, I get PTSD from delivering these estimates to developers now, because every time they see it, the cost is up. You know, and you, you wait a year or two, you update your numbers and you're seeing a 20% escalation on, a, on an estimate, or you're seeing a pro, pro forma constrict. Uh, and you start to wonder how long can this last? And it's the, it's the exhaustion you see in the market, adding the COVID lockdowns, adding the, the continual cost escalation, the unknowns where the government policies are going to be. In. I genuinely feel that there's quite a lot of exhaustion as well as the enthusiasm, um, which I'm hoping that sorts to start to level itself out, especially volumes of work in that the scary thing is, is we're not building enough homes. So we actually have to ramp up. So how is it we ramp up? How is it we address those needs of increased workforces, increased sites, speeding the whole process up. And it kind of still ties into that affordability. We're saying there's a lack of supply, but we're going to say we're going to struggle to increase supply. So how do you get that balance? I think it's a unique challenge. And again, I think the construction industry and the development industry can deal with it. They just need to be let alone to actually deal with it and solve the problems versus having a bunch of people that aren't necessarily in the industry or reactionary policies put in place that, or a detriment. They're not pushing us forward. It's just doing the same thing over and over again, which definition of insanity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, Marlon, of course, I agree with all those points. But it, it, the, the, the big thing that we're, we're going to see over the next number of months is sort of the, the, the noise in the marketplace, right? And, the, from geopolitical to, you know, national, there's, 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 Plenty of issues with affordability and especially with interest rates and you know, how we deal with inflation and especially with what we're seeing with, with gas prices and how that impacts the, the 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 cost of goods and whether or not that that itself will slow down the slow, slow down the economy. Um, so there's this noise in the marketplace that we have to learn that is similar to with this with the, with this pandemic we have to try, deal with it. Oh, Overall, I think we were going into a, a positive direction, both on economic growth and and where we're heading, and especially the employment numbers are, are are better than compared to a year ago. But it's that noise that we hear on a, sort of on a daily, weekly basis that causes minor disruptions or or jitters in the marketplace that we have to try to get through. And I think so far that what we've seen in the past twenty months that companies and, and people have pivoted and they've adjusted. And we just that sort of just has to continue as we sort of get closer and closer to what whatever we're defining now, level of normalcy going forward. Yeah, and I think Abby, because it sounds like a negative end, I think generally myself and Ray very positive on the market going forward. We just think there's going to be there's going to be challenges, and like I say, I, uh, there's some exceptionally good developers in Canada and North America. Uh, we they tend to figure stuff out and get stuff done. And I think that's going to carry on. And I think there's going to be a few interesting bumps in the road. But overall, very, very positive. Just don't look at your next estimate. It probably increased in value. <laughs> well, I love that you ended it on a positive note. And I appreciate both your opinions. And I just want to thank you both so much for this insightful discussion and for the great perspectives you both provided. I know I'm particularly grateful to have you both. I know how at, on demand both of you are as speakers and you have so much knowledge to share. So I'm really excited to do these podcasts with you guys moving forward. Uh, so thank you so much to both of you and special thanks to our audience. Uh, thank you for taking the time to listen to our very first podcast. We'll be releasing new podcasts on a monthly basis and we will have special guests join us along the way. If you would like to nominate someone or yourself or you have any specific questions or subjects you'd like us to cover, please email us at the link below. We will post a link under the video and uh, we hope to hear from you. 
And hopefully you join us on the journey and watch our future podcasts. Thank you all so much and have a wonderful week ahead. 